sweet spot is a member of the Mice Chat Podcast Network. MicePod.com Now, the magical kingdom in a mixed up world. world. You're in the sweet spot, baby. You're in the sweet spot, girl. You're in the sweet spot, darling. It's a magical kingdom in a mixed up world. You're in the sweet spot, baby. You're in the sweet spot, girl. You're in the sweet spot, darling. It's a magical kingdom in a mixed up world. Welcome to the Sweep Spot Podcast. My name is Lynn, your host, and Ken's my co-host. How's it going, Ken? Hey, hey, Lynn. It's going. I'm looking forward to tonight's episode. We have got a full slate, I think. Yes, this is episode 224. Wow. I know. I know. But we have a lot more to go in this show, so we need to get right to it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls... We invite you to turn your attention to the sky high above Sleeping Beauty Castle, where if you believe and wish hard enough, you too will see the magic of Tinkerbell as she lights this evening's performance of Fantasy in the Sky. Okay, our guest tonight is someone that we've been trying to set up for a while now, and Ken and I are both very excited to talk to her, and I think you will really enjoy this interview as well, and her name is Gina Rock. Welcome to our show, Gina. Hi there, guys. Nice to meet you. Nice to finally make contact with you guys. I know we've been talking about it for a long time, and Joshua mentioned it, and I was really excited about coming on your show. Cool. Well, we're excited to have you. And in case everyone's like, all right, well, who is she? You know, so <laughs> I didn't really say that in the beginning. But so you, just to get out, out in the front here, you were Tinkerbell from, was it 1983 to 2005? Is that correct? Yes, mm-hmm. I was. 1983. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was hired in about March and then I started in June that's um, in 1983 and so you were the Tinkerbell that flew above Fantasyland from the Matterhorn to be, um, fantasy, behind Fantasyland there um, how we'll just start off with the first basic question is how did you get to be Tinkerbell at Disneyland and what experience um, helped you to get that job well, actually, I'd like to ask you guys a yeah. question first, okay. if sure. I can. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know what you guys did oh. at Disneyland. Well, <laughs> um, we basically just stood around and uh, and talked with guests, and that was just basically it. We got paid for that, but it was <laughs> no. Uh, what? Well, you know what we did because we would we would call up to you and say, "Can you tell us where the popcorn spill is?" And you'd point. <laughs> <laughs> you'd point to it. You say it's right over there. That's why you were up there was to 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 spot the large messes that we were to clean up because we were both in custodial. We were day custodial sweepers. Um, uh, the people who so keep the awesome. park clean while it's operating. You know, so our shift might be six in the morning uh, to like you know four thirty in the afternoon, or we might start at like three in the afternoon and go till one thirty in the morning. Something like that. So we were both Disneyland Day Custodial Sweepers. We both made foremen, and we would uh, often work neighboring areas and have a crew underneath us. And we got to see you perform. We got to see you land. And, uh, yeah, (laughs) because that was the time we were there. I have, like, what years was that? Um, Um, Well, Len, you go first. Well, I, I didn't start until 1998 in Custodial. I was in foods from 91 to 93, and then I left in 2005, or 7, 
I'm sorry, 2007. Yeah, I left in 2005. Yeah. I started in custodial in 1990. And then after 15 years and two days, I left in 2005. So we all uh, kind of left in 2005. Yeah, that's when everything just went downhill because all yeah. three of us, <laughs> all three of us started to just check out by then. Just you going, know. okay. We've... So that leads me to a, a question. Mm -hmm. I did a show where nobody was in the park and they filmed it. Okay, I better think about what year this was or Joshua will be hounding me for this information. <laughs> um, I had to shoot a video. They took a video of me. I had giant... I had to throw confetti, giant confetti, out of a tub while I was flying because they needed to use it for a celebration. Hmm. And I'm trying to think. I think it was for an anniversary. Maybe it was for the, what was it, for the... Uh... Well, year gee, 2000, what... yeah, I think it was the year 2000. That would have been, what, 45th anniversary, yeah. Yeah, so I think what they did is they closed the park down. They closed, yeah, I think it maybe it was for, for a filming. Um, they closed the park down, and I went up there. It was so cool because the whole park was lit up, and there was no gas. Wow. And you guys had been down there. You would have had a huge mess to clean up. <laughs> yeah. I was taking this giant glitter, <laughs> I mean, these giant packets that were like glitter, and throwing them out of the tub. Confetti and, makes everything better, you know? Oh, it's... yeah. I mean, it, it, it had to be a mess, and then I had to do it a few times. Mm -hmm. So you guys would have been sweeping that stuff up for days. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that, but, uh, yeah. Been any yeah, it might have been for the opening of of California. I'm not really sure. I think or either that or it was the because it changed to the year 2000. I think it might have had something to do with that. Hmm. Hmm. Another thing for him to look into. I'll have to do some research, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I could ask one of our custodial managers that have been has been there a long time. He might remember cuz he had to coordinate it with the cleanup part. I don't know. Well, it's definitely a time when everybody was out of the park. I think I had to come in at around 11. I remember coming in at like 10 or 11 at night. And we actually, I don't remember if Patty did it or not, um, the other gal that used to fly, my ex-sister-in-law. Oh. Um, but, yeah, we, you know, I, it was late at night after the park closed and then I went up there and I was just throwing the stuff all over the place and I just remembered that. <laughs> so yeah, that would have been a huge mess. Oh yeah. It's interesting. So what did you guys see me? I mean, you would see me a lot. I mean, did you work at night hours or? Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. We both work nights a lot. Well, yeah, early on, you know, with less seniority, worked more nights, and then uh, uh, when again, when we became foremen, when we became leads, uh, that had a whole different seniority, so it was like, you know, the people who had been there forever were doing the opening shifts, and we were doing the closing shifts. So, so yeah. The thing okay, so you saw yeah. me fly quite a bit then. Yeah. In yeah, fact, for, for my orientation in 1998... We were doing the orientation, which was kind of like a training session inside of, um, it was behind the Plaza Gardens, was where the custodial office used to be, and we were doing like a classroom training, and they said, okay, it's almost time, and I was like, time for what? And so we went over to where you land, that tower back there, and 
everyone's standing around waiting. I'm like, what's going to go? What's going on? No, they didn't tell us. And then all of a sudden, boom, there you come. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool. So you guys were standing down there while they were taking bets to see if I came in or not? Yeah. yeah. yeah there was a whole there was because, a whole betting board there. Yes, there was. With the odds and everything. I actually made it to the, I write about it in our book. I actually made it to the top of the Matterhorn um, from the inside. I didn't climb the outside, but I I'm acrophobic. I don't I'm afraid of heights. But I couldn't pass up the chance to get up there, and so I'm like, my goodness, there's somebody who who leaps off of this thing, <laughs> you know. Yes, it, it is very, yeah, I stated in one of my other podcasts that the most terrifying flight I had was, well, that wasn't the most terrifying, but hmm. it was pretty difficult to do in the daytime because you could really see everything. And when it's dark, you you know, people think the fireworks are close, but they're actually pretty far away, as you know. Mm-hmm. In fact, how they are pretty far. I mean, they, that was like, how far? Uh, that, to behind Toontown, so. Well, they used to just yeah, they used yeah. to just shoot them off back behind Toontown, and and nowadays they have some that are that are positioned over Fantasyland and stuff like that, but. But the bulk of them are shot off, you know, back there behind Toontown. Yeah. Well, they look close to other people, but they're definitely not close. No. It's going to be interesting to see when when Star Wars, the Star Wars area called Galaxy's Edge, when that's opened up, it's going to be interesting to see how they handle the fireworks then because that's going to be back, you know, that's back close to where they used to land, you know, where the fireworks, the shells used to land. You know. Well, uh, from what I understand, there's something like Buzz Lightyear going up there, and Tinkerbell's not going to be flying. Is that true? They've had other. They've had different characters. You yeah. know, depending on the show, they've had Dumbo, and uh, yeah, they've had. So I wouldn't be surprised if Buzz Lightyear is one of them. Yeah. yeah, that's what I found out from Skywalking when I did the podcast with them that they would change that, and I. Yeah. I really think that the fans would be upset about that. Yeah, I think it's a temporary. It's like for a Pixar celebration thing, and I think it's. Oh, that's right. Kind that's of, right. There's the Pixar temporary. celebration yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, it's probably temporary. Yeah, then. it is. Yeah. So, well, I, th- I, well, I, th- I think the Pixar celebration is going to be kicked off by John Lasseter. Never mind. No. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> folks. That's a bad joke. <laughs> Uh, anyway. Edit. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, it was always fascinating to see you come in there and how fast you were going. And it looked like they had like a like a mattress or some sort of a padding to stop you. Is that correct? Yeah, it was definitely a it, – it looked like a mattress. Uh, you could hold it on each side, mm-hmm. and they would drag it. Um, they would be able to slide it so that if I was coming in really hard, they could, you know, brace for that. Mm -hmm. And how they would know I was landing really hard, I would bark while I was coming in like a dog. Oh, okay. (laughs) I I remember hearing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just do do like this. You know, and like if I barked really loud, then they'd know that I was going to land in the mat really hard. And if they really didn't hear me say anything, then they knew it was going to be pretty light. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of their heads up. But there's been times when I, there was actually one time when I actually knocked them over. Uh And that was because the brakes on the trolley um, have to be set and reset, depending on the wind and Mm -hmm. how fast it's blowing. So somebody had, uh, I think the night before we had, we had tightened up the brakes pretty hard because um, something was going on with a tailwind or something. Hmm. But then, then we had to back them off, and they they kept being adjusted. And I don't even remember them actually writing that down. Now that I think about it, you know, I'm kind of in the engineering field, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. I wonder if they were taking those stats and if they wrote it down in a book 
Yeah. So that's kind of a question, another research question that would be great to yeah. find out if they had those stats. But yeah, one day they forgot to um, make the brakes a little looser because I had a really heavy headwind. And we had wind readings up there, a wind reader. And if it was a heavy duty headwind, they'd back off the brakes. Well, they forgot to do that. Um, and one time I got stuck. Yeah. And one time they forgot to tighten them up. And I came in so fast. I mean, I, I, I barked really loud <laughs> to let the guys know it was going to be really, really fast. And there's a little trick that you do in um, when you fly on a trapeze, when you turn your shoulder mm -hmm. in order to um, land on the platform on the trapeze. So that's what I did. I just basically had to think back to my trapeze days, and I turned my shoulder really hard, and I went into the mat really hard, and those guys got knocked over because I wow. think I was going like, I don't know, really fast, like yeah. 15 or 16 miles an hour or something. Usually I'm going like 11. So mm -hmm. anyway, it was just, I don't know how fast it was. I just know that <laughs> it was. Uh... So what they had is they had the mattress to slow me down, but then they actually had a trampoline in back of that. Oh. So there was actually two objects, and that was the fail-safe. Mm -hmm. that if anything should happen where they couldn't stop me, I would hit the trampoline with the mat, and that's what happened. And that didn't bounce me back or anything, you know, literally like a trampoline. It just it just helped the mat to uh, to make a, a stop there. So, so the trolley, you were speaking of a trolley. It's uh, So your hand, are you gripping onto that, like handlebars kind of thing, or...? How did that work? Well, that's more of an Indiana Jones trick. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I believe Indiana Jones used to, he'd grab the trolley and uh, he'd do that big slide across uh -huh. and down the mountain. Uh, with me, I was, um, I had wires, uh -huh. guy wires that were hanging off my costume or on my harness. I had a harness that I would wear and the guy wires um, would be hooked up there. I'd, what it would happen is I would get up on this box mm -hmm. on the Matterhorn, and I would kind of stoop down while they would attach the wires to the trolley. And then once, and they had a, um, mm -hmm. a grip, a vice grip, that would prevent the trolley from going anywhere. In fact, I don't know if you guys ever saw it. Have you guys been in the tunnel that goes down in, towards the costuming? I'm sure you've been down there yeah right yeah. yeah so there is a there's a plaque in the tunnels in the employee tunnel mm -hmm. have you ever seen it no yeah we, we we would we would go through the tunnel all the time but what well, what was the object in there that you're referring well to? there's like there was a glass it was kind of like a you know a, a glass case mm-hmm that you would put memorabilia in. Yeah, they had a time tunnel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh -huh. That's where it is. And I don't, you know, I haven't been back in years only because I've been on the road working disasters. But I went I went in there towards, 2000, towards the end of 2005, and I actually took a video. I have a friend who took a video of it. And it's there. It's It's got the vice grips on a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> because that was you know the running joke with the with the vice grips and so I I put it on a plaque and that's where it is. It's got me flying and I'm there in that glass case in wow. in the employee tunnel. Yeah. So that's um, something that I'm hoping that Joshua and I can go visit the park and I can bring him in there and we can take another video of it. It'd be great. Yeah, um, I might I might be able to work something out for you so you don't have to, but we'll see. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely ready to go back and and visit and um, and get back in there and to that tunnel. Oh yeah. And I know that Joshua is just dying to see this thing. So. Well, that's interesting. I I always wondered how how it all went down and 
now I, I remember when I asked you about gripping. Now I remember you weren't, you weren't, your hands were free. Um, well, my hands were definitely free. I yeah. had to, I had these crazy costumes. I was telling some of the other podcasts that I had one that where I lit up. Like basically, I was the Christmas tree, if you <laughs> want to put it that way. I was just the person holding the lights. Mm-hmm. Because I was, you know, they were decorating me like a Christmas tree. My wings would light up, and my even my feet lit up. Even the pom poms on my feet. So I'd have this little button in my hand, and before I'd fly, I'd have to remember. I had to remember to turn on the wand with my left hand, and I had to to click this button with my right hand to get all the lights to go on with my costume. Mm-hmm. They were on my costume and on my wings and on the little um, puffs on my shoes. And so I'd have to remember to do all that. Forget about trying to act like Tinkerbell. I'm just really a light fixture. <laughs> I'm the person just controlling these lights. I'm like the Christmas tree. I'm the stem on the Christmas tree. You're a lamp. You're, you're, you're a lamp. <laughs> Yeah, I was a Tinkerbell lamp. Thank you. Yeah, I think you, you, you were a major prize. <laughs> <laughs> Fragile. She's Fragile. Major, major award. Yeah. Major yeah. award, yes. Yeah. yeah, I definitely was feeling like I was not much of a Tinkerbell. I was just like helping them to to send something down that looked lit up. But it was, it was fun. I mean, I've had so many different costumes and... And, I, you know, I'm wondering if they stuck them in a Tinkerbell museum or what they did with it, you know. Is Tinkerbell Probably stuck? auctioned them off. I don't know. Oh, no. Oh, God. <laughs> don't tell me that. Uh, uh, well, that you know. painful to hear that. That seems to be what's happening with Disney stuff these days, you know. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, it would be good to find out if anything's out there. Because there's so many different pieces of equipment. But yeah, it was a it was a great time. So it was quick flight, and but it was worth it. I know how you how you got well. I know how you got down, and then we'd see you kind of walk real fast through that gate, and then through the other gate, and then through that round tunnel to the back area back there afterwards. But what um so you had to get to the Matterhorn somehow? Were you like in a disguise or some kind of a... Oh, yeah. There yeah. wasn't much of a disguise. Goodness gracious. Right. I don't know who thought of this one. <laughs> but basically, me and the crew, we would get all of the equipment together. Mm-hmm. And I had my costume on, and I put this trench coat on <laughs> and a pair of tennis shoes. And I had my wig on, and then I put this scarf over my wig... And what I would do is I would help carry the equipment across the park, yeah. trying to be inconspicuous. It's kind of hard to be inconspicuous when you're <laughs> when you're wearing something like that. But the guys would kind of, you know, we'd kind of all walk in a circle together. And mm-hmm. but it was, you know, when I think about it now, it just seems kind of silly that they didn't have a dressing room. Yeah. Inside the Matterhorn, so I didn't have to walk across the park like that. So yeah, it was. It wasn't too inconspicuous, but you know they tried their best. Yeah, and it's just fascinating to me. Um, how about or how about your first time doing it? Did, was there like a practice run or anything, or how did that? The work? first time I flew was in the daytime, and that's what I was talking about. It was right. very scary because I could tell that I was very high up, just like you stated. Yeah. You know, you got up there and it looked really high. It looks really high when you're up there. <laughs> so the first time I, I had a very healthy concern for my safety. Yeah. The first time I went, yeah, <laughs> wow, this is pretty hairy. So, <laughs> uh, so you had to have a lot of confidence in, in the rigging and the people that put it together. And, you know, I had an amazing crew. And I had, you know, they were very safety conscious. You know, there's... The first flight, like, it was scary. But there was other times, too, where there's, as an example, in the summer, the wire would stretch. When it would get hot, Mm -hmm. 
the wire would actually stretch. And they had counterweights on the other end. You know where I told you the trampoline is to stop the mattress in case it's like a fail safe if, mm-hmm. you know, those guys don't catch me? Yeah. Well, what they had is they had a counterweight that that would help me with the wire. So when I'd fly down the wire, that weight would go up and down and kind of, you know, help the effectiveness of, you know, of the flight and the wire to stay taut. But in the summer, the the wire would, um, I guess it kind of emanated the the oils hmm. that were in it, that were in the wire, in, intertwined in the wire. And it would kind of leak in the summer. And one summer, it, something happened with the counterweights. And I got up there and it looked like the wire was really slack. I mean, we're talking like drooping, drooping yeah. in the middle. Wow. And I re- and I refused to fly. I said there's no way that I can fly. This will ha- I will end up on the other end being underneath the landing strip. Mhm. I wouldn't have landed on it. I would have landed under it. So that was um, probably one of the very, very few times that I couldn't fly. Um, there's only been one time when I've ever missed a flight. Um, I, I don't, I'm not really sure what happened, but I remember calling my sub at the last minute, and I think it was a freeway accident or something. I couldn't get there, and she didn't have enough time to get there, and that was the only time they were ever mm-hmm. without the sinker valve. We just, we just told, when that happened, we just told the kids they weren't wishing hard enough. Yeah. Probably <laughs> because, you know, true. if yeah. they wished hard enough and believed strongly enough, Tinkerbell would re- would appear to fly high. You know, it's like, you just weren't wishing hard enough, kids. You know, they oh, were tired. They were tired that time of night, you know. That's one of the reasons that I did it in the first two years, I did it 300, you know, I did all all flights. So if I started in June and I ended in September, I did it every single day for like two summers. And then I think something happened where there was a bunch of traffic and it was one of those crazy accidents that I was coming in from 64 miles away from a girl. And so I was driving really far. Well, not really far, but... In distance, 64 miles is not very far, but it is in Los Angeles if yeah, something Los happens. Yeah, Los Angeles, it's, you know, yeah. traffic. And I yeah. remember having one of those, remember those first phones that came out and they were really heavy? Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. They weren't the mobile phones, they were those phones in the boxes and and they were really heavy. And I had to get one because this one time that accident happened and it was getting really late out they expected me never any later than eight o'clock at night to fly at 9 30 and i was on that freeway and i must have called them 15 times going what am i going to do i'm behind these accidents and i'm going to get there but so what happened was there i (laughs) there was these motorcycle policemen that were kind of going in between the cars to get to the accident or just making sure people were okay because we were idle. And I waved one down. And I told him <laughs> that I did Tinkerbell at the park. And I was only about, I think I was only 15 miles away. But I just wasn't going anywhere. And I flagged the officer down and I told him who I was. And he goes, you know what? I'll tell you what. We're not supposed to do this, but let's go ahead. We're going to get on the side of the highway here, and I want you to follow me. And that guy took me to the park. Wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and he, got, he got me there. I think I got what they did is they were ready for me to be late because I kept calling. So what we had planned by phone is, well, yeah, I think at that time I had the phone. What we planned is that they went and took everything to the Matterhorn, and I just pulled in, and I got there, I think, I flew at 9, 9.25 every night. 
And I think I pulled into the park at nine o'clock. And they said, Gina, just run across the park, just get in here, check in, and go right to the Matterhorn. And they had all my stuff there waiting for me. And I mean, it, I was just like, out of breath and you know it's that whole saying the show must go on yeah that's true the show has to go on <laughs> wow. so i did make it and they had everything ready for me and i got up there and i flew and it was so that's when they finally decided gina do you think that there's anybody that we could use for a backup and i said yeah you know it's at the time i was married and uh, to a gentleman who's uh flew on the trapeze with his brother and I was married to the catcher and uh, his wife was uh, Patty Rock and she flew trapeze for many years with them and so you know I, I helped her to get hired in and so she was my sub for many years and then she started doing it half the time and you know rightfully so you know they should have had that from the beginning but you know, it's, things are going to happen, but you know, uh, really, there's only one time I think, and other than that, maybe that. Well, actually, there was one other time because there was a bunch of bees. <laughs> there was oh, a wow. beehive in the in the landing in the tower, <laughs> and and I couldn't go across to land because all these bees were in there. So yeah, I yeah. guess they, they wouldn't have liked that. Yeah, they yeah. wouldn't have been really happy with this. With somebody coming now, barreling in. I would have come down with like this swollen face and you know, it would have been crazy, you know. It would have been a different character. Wow. So you and a sister in law I, the nepotism in this in this park is just crazy. So. Well, yeah, actually at the time <laughs> they uh that's well, they wanted me to bring somebody in who had aerial experience. And she had been a trapeze artist or I don't know, you know, ten 15 years, something like that, and so, you know, I got her hired in, and then eventually what happened, um, they started hiring a few more, you know, towards, I think, in our last three, four years, they hired a few more, and... Well, I think they increased the number of shows, you know. Well, yeah, it got earlier and earlier every year. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, they, yeah, because, you know, like you said, when you were doing it, it was a summertime thing. And then they started adding more and more shows, and they would run, you know, sometimes the park would, wouldn't be open later, so they would just do it as soon as it got dark, you know. Yeah. Well, they always, see, I think they always had the show at 925, but the difference was... I used to start in June as soon as school would get out, like right around June 9th every year and stop by September 5th of every, the end of summer. Mm -hmm. But what ended up happening is then it started to go on weekends um, in May. And so I would fly every weekend in May and then, of course, throughout the summer. But then they backed it up again. And then it was March, and then they backed it up to April, doing the weekends every Saturday. And the, and then it went all the way back to January. So we, you know, we weren't, you know, we were doing it a lot more. You know, so we, I don't know if you remember that, but mm. just started flying a lot more frequently. And so it was helpful, you know, to have subs and people that we could change times with, so... So what else have you guys seen while we're <laughs> flying around? Anything interesting? I don't think we ever got the original question. The uh, Let's see, how you got there in the first place. Oh, right. how I got to be Tinkerbell. Yeah. Well, I got to be Tinkerbell because it's something I wanted really, really bad. Talk about Wish Upon the Star. That's yeah. what I did. Um the gal who had done it before me was Judy Kay, and I worked for her husband who had a circus that traveled quite a bit overseas and around the country in the USA and around around uh, different parts of the world. So I went to Taiwan, and I asked him when I was there 
about his uh, his wife and if she was still doing it. And he said, no, they took her out for seven years because they're, they were building fantasy land. And I said, oh, man, I'd really like to just find out about that. And so I just – I had it i planted the seed for it at that time because it was just the right timing and when i got back from taiwan i just went to the park and i said do you know if they're ever going to put tinkerbell back and they said yeah they're putting her back in six months and i went oh my god well <laughs> definitely i wanted it to be i wanted to be a part of the magic so i just really you know when you want something bad enough and I guess if you wish hard enough, then it happens. But, yeah, I was aggressively yes. pursuing the job, definitely. Um, Just click your heels together and say there's no place like the top of the Matterhorn. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. And so, um, Maybe I should have worn the red ruby slippers instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> instead of the green ones. Yeah, it was definitely it was a dream for me. I had... Um, you know how they have the grad nights there? Yeah. Okay. Well, I went there for a grad night when I was 16 with um, someone who was one year older and was graduating from high school where I went. And he invited me to go to grad night over there. And we went to grad night, and we were leaving you know, walking out of the park and goes, oh, no, 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 stop. you got to turn around and watch this. And I said, what? And he goes, what? just watch this. And I turn around and I see this girl flying. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's so awesome. What a great job. And that was, <laughs> that was before I was even knew I was going to So that was the, the first time, you know, that... I really knew. I, I knew early. <laughs> I knew before I knew. You know, yeah. I knew I wanted to be Tinkerbell. <laughs> and um, so yeah, that's that's how I started. Wow. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, that's not. Uh, that's pretty oh. unique stuff, you know. That's I, you know what? I, there's a question I have to ask you guys oh, sure. that yeah, Joshua sure. told me about. And this is really interesting to me because my absolutely favorite animal in the world is an elephant. And I, I want to hear this story about your elephant story before I tell you my elephant story. Our elephant story. You guys have an elephant story about something. There is a there is an elephant story in the book, but it it was a story told by somebody else because it didn't happen to us specifically. Oh, it didn't. Okay. And it was so, it was when they do, it was when they're doing circus fantasy there in the late eighties, and uh, I remember that they had you know with for ver for many many years you had the very merry Christmas parade. Uh, now they have Christmas Fantasy Parade. But back then, it was a very Merry Christmas Parade, and they had live horses at the start of the parade. And so you'd have custodial units follow those horses, um, three three sweepers, to clean up after them in the middle of the parade. And uh, same thing was needed for the Circus Fantasy Parade, which had live elephants. But uh, as, as detailed in the book... Um, <laughs> You know, things didn't go as planned, and there ended up being a big spill of a big bucket of liquid. Oh. And, you know, and it ended up, you know, the big big wave is heading towards the, the, the oh. guests waiting on the side of the parade route. Oh, so. goodness gracious. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's really something. That, that reminds me of... Um, when I was at Ringling Brothers in the 70s, and I was a, I was a showgirl as well as a performer in an act, a high motorcycle act, and we would have to do, we would have to dance between, you know, certain, in, at certain times uh, in between acts getting ready. And if the elephants were out there running around, and we had, you know, a show to do, you know, we we were doing like the intermission of dancing while people were getting ready for the next 
what they were doing is they were cleaning up after the elephants. So if we had a number that we had to do, then guess what we were dancing? We were definitely dancing in the elephant dung, and we were trying to be really careful to stay away from that. Now, sometimes we would start our uh, routine right behind the elephants. We would actually be out there in the ring dancing behind the elephants. And we would just <laughs> we just look up to make sure that, you know, we knew when it was going to happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh... as Tinkerbell, 160 feet in the air, at least I didn't have to worry about getting hit with anything like that. Oh, uh, li live animals, live animals, you know, what are you going to do? I'm sure that you guys had a, some big messes to clean up there. Um, oh, yeah. You know, there, there's one thing that I haven't talked about too much on the podcast, and that's the magic um, that was brought to my life with my children. Mm -hmm. And I was told I could never have children. And wow. I put the wand in my hand, and three weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> there, there's some Disney magic for you. Yes. So, you know, first I was so excited that I got the job, and I was just radiant. You know, it's like, this is just the dream come true. And then I'd always wanted children, and I was scared I couldn't have them. And... You know, I was scared to tell the park that I was pregnant. But because it was, it was the first time, and I got pregnant in in May, and that's when we were doing it only, in, we were only flying in the summer. So I got pregnant in May, and so I really didn't show until <laughs> September, right when I was leaving. It was getting kind of tight, and I didn't say anything. They didn't know. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's interesting timing. Yeah, it was really, really exciting to um, to have that, that magic. And I tell Jennifer that she's de definitely the pixie dust kid. That's uh, my daughter, Jennifer. And then um, three years later, same time, my children were born on February 26th and 27th, which means I was again pregnant in May. Three years later, <laughs> two years later. I mean, two years later, with Austin, my son Austin. So once again, Pixie Dust was there, and they were almost born on the same day, three years apart. And my children actually grew up in the park. I would take my kids to the park with me to work. Um, sometimes when they turned like six, seven, and they got older. Uh, sometimes even three times a week. I'd bring a sitter with me, and that's when you could bring your kids through the back. As an employee, you were allowed to bring your kids in. Hmm. And that happened. We were allowed to bring them through the back. So I'd, I'd pull into the park, and the sitter would come with me, and my children were there. And, and I loved having my kids with me all the time, and I didn't like leaving at night you know, and going to work. So I took them with me a lot. And they had a blast, you know. They uh, that lasted, allowing my children to come to work with me and watch me fly. That lasted until for about 12 years, and then all of a sudden, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was some big, crazy thing that happened where some Mickey, a Mickey Mouse took his head off backstage, and some kid freaked out. And, and after that, that was it. Nobody then was ever allowed backstage again to see it, that a kid would get freaked out that somebody took their head off. Well, he was just, re you know, he was going to recite uh, Shakespearean quotations. <laughs> he just take, take his head off and just, you know, and just, to, oh, wait, that's from a different Disney production. Never mind. But... Yeah, no, the yeah, the bat the rules of backstage stuff has changed so much over the years. Um, yeah. I mean, we were there when when the uh, when the park expanded to a resort and they had to hire so many more people and they just weren't sure about some of these people. 
Uh, I mean, we used to, I used to be able to get from point A to point B really fast. Like if I, if I was in one place and I needed to go clean up something somewhere else, if the shortest distance was straight through a store, you know, uh, enter th through the stock closet, get out there into the store, get out to the location. That's what I would do. And, but then they started, you know, putting codes and locks and everything on because, you know, they didn't want cast members shoplifting. Oh, and and, oh. and then, then of course, 9-11 happened, and, uh, you know, security became even more tight. Right. And so yeah. it just kind of changed. So it, over the years, it has changed a lot. Well, that's basically what happened with my job. You know, I started my doing uh, disaster recovery in 2005 with Katrina. And uh, it, because of 9-11, it was very stringent to get in. And we had to jump through a lot of hoops to get badged for Homeland Security. So I'm still doing that to this day. I'm still uh, doing disaster recovery. I'm working at Hurricane Harvey. Mm. And that's um, DR-4332 is Hurricane Harvey. And I'm working for, with uh, public assistance. So... That's what I'm doing right now, and I'm deployed as we speak, and um, it's a great job. You know, it's uh, helping folks, and yeah. you know. So you're kind of doing what we used to, what, what we did at Disney. You're cleaning up messes. Yeah, basically that's <laughs> what. I'm, yeah. You're helping people put their lives back together and things yeah. like that is what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a correlation there between what you guys did and what I've been doing for 12 <laughs> years. Yeah. You know, when, th when you know, because it's got to be done because otherwise things just fall apart, you know. you got to have recovery. You've got to have upkeep. Wow. So so when you brought your kids there, was it like a Clark Kent situation? Like, gee, Mommy disappears. Uh, you know, she's never around when Tinkerbell's flying. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it was really no, fun. I mean, they, my they, kids... They, the, my do. kids they would do. be out in the park, and they would say to people, "Oh, look up there! There's my mom." You know, they were young, like when yeah. they were young, and they, they, and people that were standing around them would go, "What are you talking about? That's your mom." Of and course. so people would want my kids to sign autographs because <laughs> I was the person up there, and they were meeting my kids. It was really funny, but yeah, they used to get. You know, my kids would get all excited and go away, watch my mom, you know, and look up there. And then, of course, as they got older, it's like, okay, whatever. They get <laughs> stuck on a ride somewhere, not even see me fly. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, for a long time, they watched me fly, and then they went, okay, whatever. You know, so. <laughs> You're so uh, but it was fun taking my kids to the park, and I loved it. It's a great place to raise your kids. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, like you said, it's so stringent now. I mean, I I feel really lucky that I was able to go through a time like that. Yeah, it was definitely a special time. I mean, if you st you started what you said eighty three. Yep, nineteen eighty three. I mean, you know, you started. <laughs> the, the the guys the guys running the entire company were still the guys that had been around Walt Disney, and uh, certainly at the park. Because the park management didn't change really until like 93, 94. But the entire corporation, you know, still under the people who, yeah. you know, were, were Walt's people and stuff like that. And, of course, it, you know, time marches on and becomes a huge, large corporation. <laughs> yes, but, it did. We had, there was a lot of changes. I mean, when that whole thing started, we were actually able to, I had to call up every year in January and go, oh, when are you guys going to renew my contract? Keeping yeah. in mind, I was a talent agent as well. So I was actually hiring uh, talent for the park as well, Variety Acts. And I would call up just like a booking agent that I was and say, oh, are you going to be renewing my contract now? <laughs> and I'd have to kind of be my own booking agent. It was kind <laughs> of weird. And then all of a sudden, I'm like that, and that weird 13-year mark, then it was, you know, why are you guys running your own show, and why are you calling up to ask about your contract? How come we're not taking care of this? I'm like, I don't know. 
I'm like, I've been doing this so long, you know, me and the crew, we would just like call each other up and go, oh, okay, you gonna get, you're going to get the equipment ready? They're like, yeah, we're going to get it ready. Are you going to call the office and see if you're booked? And yeah, I'm going to call. And it'd be the same thing. It went on for like 11, 12, 13 years. Then all of a sudden the corporation went, okay, hold on here. All right. So we're in charge and we're going to call you and we'll make you an offer and <laughs> like okay yeah it, i think that's the way it's supposed to go but it kind of took the control out of it it was like it was so much fun for me and the crew and patty like we'd all just be able to just get our own show together and we didn't you know we didn't do the whole corporate thing and like you said all of a sudden there they were right is that what you're saying that yeah. they just kind of showed up yeah yeah. Right. Same right. Huh. Lynn, do you have any more questions? I don't know. I, I think we've hit a lot of the questions this I is, had listed here. Um, it's very interesting. I yeah. Mean, it's, it's, this is, uh, you know, this is very. I think unique. our I, th I think this is really giving people an insight into something that, you know, it's uh, nowadays the, the the pyro shows have changed over the years, but. I mean, this was a major thing. It was Fantasy in the Sky, which I think they're going to recreate for some special parties coming up. But, you know, um, all of the pyrotechnics were, were shot off from the north end of the park. And it was kicked off with Tinkerbell's flight. And that was such a special moment. Um, and people would try to get, like, the best spot uh on Main Street where they would get the best angle to see Tinkerbell fly over the castle. And uh, it was just such an iconic moment and so so magical. Um, and so it's, and it was a huge part. I mean, I, I became an annual pass holder in 1985. and But before then, you know, it had been maybe once or twice a year we'd come visit. But, of course, it's, being there for the fireworks and seeing that was always just a special moment. So, and I never dreamed that I would actually be talking with the person who was doing it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I never dreamed that I'd be on a podcast with people that worked in your department. I mean, I actually, <laughs> it's, I feel honored. I really do. This well, thank is you. awesome. It's thank just, you. Like I said, we relied on you to relay, hey, look, there's a mess. You, you'd point with your wand, look, there's a mess <laughs> over there. We would go get, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you know what? Everybody had their, you know, when I went to my orientation, basically I loved the way they stated, you know what? Everybody is part of the show. You know, I went into that orientation and it was really fun. And they kind of, you know, asked around the room, oh, what are you going to be doing? What are you going to be doing? And all of a sudden I, I had to tell them what I was going to be doing. <laughs> and I remember people just going, what? <laughs> like, I remember them being shocked and I was kind of like I was I remember my face turning red and everybody turning around looking at me and it's like <laughs> you know I had never really worked uh, for a corporation or a you know big entity like that and yeah. other than Ringling well Ringling Brothers I did right. but yeah it was um, the orientation was fun and it's like it, this everybody is part of the show it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter if you're sweeping the street or you're playing tinkerbell it doesn't matter yeah. who you are and i thought that that concept was was really smart of walt to develop mm -hmm. yes yes you're you're we're putting on a show here yep. it's not it's not just a place but it's a show that really puts people in a certain mindset yeah, yeah it does it does. Um, I actually, I had a really um, fun booking that I did over there. Do you remember when Indiana Jones opened up? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So I was booking talent for the park a little bit, and, and when they owned the Queen Mary, I was booking a lot of entertainment over there, and it was so much fun. I had to hire for the media opening for Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. They had me uh, hire stilt walkers. Fire eaters, sword swallowers, <laughs> little people. I mean, I had all kinds of people that, um, you know, the variety talent was just, it was a great event. You know, it was a great part of that media event. I had a blast. 
it was so much fun to be Tinkerbell and be able to book talent in the park. And so uh, just really honored, you know, with the whole thing. And it's just awesome that you guys are interviewing me at my advanced age. And, <laughs> and I can look back on this and go, wow, this is awesome. You know, there's no, there's no differences here. We're all just one big show, right? Yeah, that's the good old days. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't know much about it now, but I'm thinking now that I think about it, if you guys are going to bring Joshua and I in there and there's any problems, I can just put my Homeland Security badge on and maybe that they'd let me through. <laughs> I'm sure they would, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I, I, can't, I cannot do that unless yeah. I'm... But, you know, I do understand the importance of our security. Yeah. It's really, really important that our homeland security is intact. And oh, yeah. we're all a big part of, you know, making sure everybody's okay. Well, I'm glad they've added the um, metal detectors at Disneyland. I think that's a good idea. Oh, did they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What yeah. year they, was that? Uh, last year or so? I think, they just, yeah, I think they just did it, like, within this last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they've had bag check, which is very minimal, but they've, they, it's not just Disneyland. I mean, Knott's Berry Farm just did it this past year. Oh. Uh, you know, it's becoming a big thing that you're going to go find it in almost any venue of any size, you know. So. Yep. Well, it's, um, everything's changed, and if you guys get a chance, uh, I'd definitely like to hook that up for him for Joshua Schaefer and I to come to the park and have him film that uh, the plaque in the in the tunnel that would just be unbelievable if we could get that. Huh. Might have to ask somebody to. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I <laughs> could get you guys in, but I know I could get someone to videotape it for you, and then yeah. well, that would be great. Yeah. Even better, you yeah. know. It's, I'm, I'd, I'd like that, but mm -hmm. yeah, if you could hook that up, that would just be great. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add that maybe we didn't ask? or? No, but I would love to be invited back. Then yeah. this is fun. Oh, this for is sure. a blast. Yeah, for sure. Um, they should they should probably find something for you to do in, in the Star Wars thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, I, I am in my advanced stage, but there is – well, there is something I'd like to add. Mm -hmm. um, Joshua Schaefer, who's of course my public relations manager, and he, he's written that wonderful book for Disney Guides and yeah. Part yes. Two now, and I'm in that one. Um, he's built a website for me, actually today. It went up today, and uh, you can basically go to flyingtinkerbell.org, and it's up. Um, my website is up, and. There's autographs that you can order from there, and you can read about the history of, you know, how I became Tinkerbell and what I'm doing now. And um, it's it's only the website is only 50% built. Okay. But you know, it's you can get on it right now if you want. So that's uh, flyingtinkerbell.org. All right. Uh, you can find it there, or go through my LinkedIn page. If you go through Gina Rock on LinkedIn, you can also find it at the bottom of the page with the link. So. I will for sure put this in our show notes, and uh, our listeners will check it out for sure, I know. Well, great. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I, I hope I can come back. Oh, you will, yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. All right. You too. Have a good night. Okay, well that concludes episode 224 of the Sweet Spot Podcast. Wow, that was wow. quite a 224, man. Oh, gosh. I'll have to say that that was probably one of our better shows. Yeah, well, yeah, if we do say so humbly. Humbly. You know what? Actually, this last episode, 223, with Chris and the live music, we have had a lot of compliments. So if you had not listened to that show and this is your first time, um, listening to our show or maybe you didn't listen to that show we've had a lot of compliments and I really humbly think it came out very good so um, if you like Disneyland music and you're interested in that sort of thing 
it really did turn out good and in January we're going to continue that um, that um, series or whatever you want to call it um, to get more history on the live music at Disneyland so check that out but before we go we want to mention a few things that we are authors of a book called Cleaning the Kingdom and if you have a Disney especially Disneyland fan in on your shopping list this year um, this would be a good gift to get them because um, we have it in paperback and they are signed by both Ken and I and or you could um, get them a uh, like a gift card or something to Kindle I think you can do that because our book is on Kindle yeah or you can get our audiobook and that is on iTunes store through audiobooks or through audible.com so you can check that out and then also our show is just added to Spotify this week so you can go to Spotify. Spotify. Yes. No, our book, you mean? No, the show. I'm sorry. The show. Oh. The show okay. is added to Spotify. They have a podcast so, section. So if you like listening to us, there's, you know, you can listen to our show on all these places, and you can listen, you can listen to our book mm-hmm. on the audiobook. So. Yeah. There's a lot of choices there. So check that out. Um, I will get that mailed out to you if you order from our website at thesweetspot.com for the paperback books. I will get those out to you as soon as possible because I know that um, you'll want those before Christmas if it is for a gift. So, um, And if you have, like, say you want it autographed to a certain person, like Joey or something, um, you, there is a place on there when you do your transaction through PayPal where you can put notes and you can put, please sign to, you know, Jose or whatever. And, and we will... Um, I will address it to that person and um, we'll have their signatures there so that that would be kind of cool if, if that's something you desire um, also we have a new review and I like to read our iTunes reviews because we appreciate everyone that does this and all our listeners um, all right this one is from Ken from the it OC wasn't, it wasn't me I promise you Ken from OC I thought he already left him then. All right, so this is me. He left another. Um, uh, it says... Uh, There's more than one can in the O's. <laughs> that's true. Uh, it's titled Loved, Loved, Show 223. Yeah, I was just speaking of that. Um, five stars. It says, These shows just keep getting better and more fun to listen to. The latest show, 223, Live Music at Disneyland, brought back a lot of memories. Their guest, Disney... Chris was a wealth of information and together with the music clips made for a real journey through Disneyland history. Nice work, guys. Ken Goldberg from Orange County, California. Aww. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Appreciate thank you very much. That. You can be like Ken and um, leave us a review on iTunes and we will read it on our next episode. Um, I think that will do it, Ken. Um... You can get all the information, our show notes on all the current events that we talked about um, on our website, and all you can get T-shirts over there. Speaking of gifts, you can get T-shirts. There's links over there. You can there's links to our audiobook that I mentioned through Audible, um, links to our Kindle books, um, ways to buy our. So there's, everything is at thesweepspot.com. Yeah, and, and find us on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, yeah, and just spread the word because our podcast is pretty easy to find. I mean, you know, it's on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and my That's chat. Right. So this will probably be our last show until after Christmas. So I want to tell everyone um, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and um, hope you have a good one. And we will talk to you after Christmas, probably do one more show before the end of the year. Thanks for listening.